Hi, welcome once again to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. Really appreciate you. And in this particular series, we shall be treating past questions from the Jam collection. So we'll be looking at a series of questions that have been asked by Jam over the years, and we'll be giving well detailed explanations to all of the questions as we come across them. I will implore you to try as much as possible to pay keen attention to all of the explanations that will be given in tackling all of the questions. I wish you success in your exam and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome once again to our jam series. Today we shall be taking questions from the 2022 jam biology questions and we'll be looking at the answers that are applicable to all of the questions. So we are picking it straight from the first question that we have there. These are the 2022 jam biology questions. Number one there says, sources of air pollutants are A. Industrial chimneys, burning fossil oils and river dams. B. Sulfur dioxide, acid drain and pesticides. C. Sulfur dioxide, vehicle exhaust and aerosols. And then D. We have sewage, smoke and old vehicles. Now we are looking specifically at what we refer to as oil. What we are looking for there is this one here that we have here, air pollutants. We are looking at air pollutants. So what are air pollutants? Air pollutants are substances that actually pollute the air. Those are the things that we are looking out for. So when we look at air pollutants, we are actually talking about substances that will be able to pollute the air. So let us look at our options carefully. The first option that we have there says industrial chimneys. Industrial chimneys actually release uh, gases or release smokes. Smokes that are sent out from the machines of the machines uh, from the plants in the industries. So that is what industrial chimneys here is talking about. Then we have burning fossil oils. Yes, when we burn fossil oils, definitely there is going to be the release of smokes, which can actually pollute the air. But when we talk about river dams, river dams actually does not pollute the air. If there is going to be any type of pollution from the uh, river dams, it is going to be water pollution. So option A is not our answer. Then option B there says sulfur dioxide, acid drain and pesticide. If you look at that, it is talking about sulfur dioxide can actually pollute the air. But when we talk about acid drain, acid drain can also be as a result of some substances that have actually mixed with the water in the air, specifically talking about the atmospheric nitrogen. And then we talk about pesticide. Pesticide are substances that are used on plants specifically to control pests. So that is definitely not going to be our option either because all the three there are not substances that can pollute the air. And when we look at option C, the option C there says sulfur dioxide, vehicle exhaust and aerosols. Sulfur dioxide, vehicle exhaust and aerosols yes when we look at sulfur dioxide sulfur dioxide can actually pollute the air it causes respiratory disturbances vehicle exhaust also causes the release of carbon monoxide and then we have aerosols from several types of perfumes and uh roll-ons so those also can result to air pollution and then the last one here we will talk about sewage sewage can actually not result to air pollution because it can only cause uh land majorly land pollution so our option there is going to be option C. Then we'll move to question two. The body of a snail is divided into head, A, thorax and abdomen, head, visceral mass and abdomen, head, the thorax and foot. Then option D there says head, visceral mass and foot. Now when we look at the body parts of a snail, it is divided into three. Yes, we have talked about the question has given us the first option, which is going to be the head. So what are the other two parts that we have in the body of the snail? It is definitely not the thorax no, and the abdomen. The uh, snail does not have what to refer to as thorax. And it does not have what to refer to as abdomen either. So it is not option A and it is not option B. It is not option C also because we already said earlier on that it doesn't have thorax. Please permit us. This here is thorax. It doesn't have thorax and foot. So the answer there is option D. It is the what? The visceral body or the visceral mass and foot. That is the answer to question two. So the part of the snail is divided into three. We have the head, the visceral mass or the visceral body. In some places you see it as vis visceral body. And then the last part 
in the body of the snail is the food so that is our answer to question two option d option d so we move to question three an adaptation for defense in animals is a croaking of a male toad b basking in lizard c spines in porcupine fish and d huddling together of penguins now when we look at what this particular question is talking about it is talking about adaptation for defense the defensive mechanisms that some animals possess having to help them to uh, defend themselves against invaders or against predators now when we look at the first option here croaking of the male toad it is actually uh, an adaptive feature that is used for actually securing meat that is what this one here it is not for defense and then basking in the sun is for body temperature structural uh, adaptation for regulation of their body and then when we talk about uh, spines in porcupine fish yes this is actually the answer to our question spines in porcupine fish why because this type of fishes particularly when they get threatened they send out because their body is laced with spikes they send out the uh, spikes that is laced on their skin when they feel threatened so the spikes have been sent out and on their skin also they have some type of uh venoms that has that is being secreted on their skin so that is basically what happens to this set of fishes so they make use of their spikes on their skin as a defense mechanism and then for the last one you're huddling together of penguins is actually to produce or to generate warmth that is why they do that so the answer to that question three is option c which is spines in porcupine fish option c then we move to question four the movement of the glenar towards the source of light is a we have tropic movement tactic movement nastic movement and kinetic movement now this particular question is talking about responses it's talking about irritability the response of organisms to different organisms that is basically what this question is talking about so where actually are we heading now we have three types there are three types of responses types of responses now the three types of responses that we have number one I said we have the tropism that is movement of the plants tropic or tropism number two we have the uh, the taxic some textbooks you see it as taxism and then the third one we have the third one to be the nastic or the nastism nastic or nastism now when we look at this one here this one is the movement of the uh the plants movement in plants this one here is movement in animals and then we have the last one now when we look at these two this first two here this this first two here they are talking about directional movement directional movement while well, this last one is talking about non-directional in both of those organisms non-directional so in this movement now or response of the plants or the animals to any of the uh the substances that they are responding to there is going to be positive and negative we have positive movement occurring towards the stimuli while negative movement or response movement or response is away from the stimuli so when we have like the question that we're talking about now is talking about the question that says 
the movement of the glenda towards the source of light. Now, first and foremost, you need to understand this organism here, iglena, is it a plant or an animal? Iglena is an animal-like protist. So, we will definitely be talking about this particular one here to be the taxic. That is what we will be looking at right now. We will be looking at taxic or taxism. And then the next thing that we we'll look out for in that question there, it says, the towards this now towards is another keyframe that we need to look out for. That is the second. That's the second thing we need to look out for towards the source. And then we have the third one there to be this. The third thing that we'll be looking out for there is going to be we have this one here, the light source, which are the light source. So it is Uglena that is moving towards the light source. So that tells us that it is a tactic movement, and then it is a positive tactic movement. So they're actually not asking us for the type of movement here. Uh, they're only talking about the source. But it is a positive tactic movement. So it is option B for question 4. If the answer is written, it will be written as positive phototaxism. That is what it will be. So that is the answer to question 4. That is option B. And then question 5. During mitosis, the stage at which chromosomes line up around the equator is A. Telophase B. Metaphase C. Anaphase and D. Prophase When we look at what this particular question here is talking about, when we look at the stages of mitosis, we have five stages of mitosis. Stages of mitosis. We have five stages. So let me depict them with a diagram. Let's imagine that we have something that looks like this. And then with a substance inside it. And gradually it moves to something that looks like this. And then it moves to something that looks And then to something that looks like this. And then lastly to something that looks like this. Now let me list them talking about the names. The names that we have for each of these here, we have the interface. We have the interface. Here we have the prophase. Here we have the metaphase. Here we have the anaphase. And this one here is called the telophase. That is the name of the, or those are the stages of all the processes that we have there for these uh, processes or the stages of mitosis. Now, if we look at that question very well now, it has actually, with what we have just drawn out here, it has actually answered our question. Let's see the question again. It says, during mitosis, the stage at which chromosomes lines up around the equator is now, the equator is usually a substance that separates a circle into two. That is what an equator is. So, if you look at our diagram here, we can see that this is a substance that looks like the equator, or like a circle. So, it is separating here now. We have the substance being separated in the middle here. We can see that this cell wall here is collapsing towards the middle. And so, that is the answer to our question there, which is the metaphase. The metaphase is the answer to our question. It is at the metaphase that we have the chromosomes lining up around the equator. So that is the answer to our question. So the metaphase is option B. Option B. So move to question 6. The waste product of insects is A. Uric acid, B. Urine, C. Mucilage, and D. Sweat organisms excrete their nitrogenous waste in three forms 
And so I will categorize organisms based on the type of nitrogenous waste that they excrete. Classification of organisms. based on their nitrogenous wastes yeah so the first one there we have the organisms that are called the ureotelic organisms Ureotelic organisms, they are organisms that excrete their nitrogenous waste in form of excrete theirs in form of urea. So example of such organisms, that is where we have man. Man, we excrete our own nitrogenous waste in form of urea, so we are ureotelic organisms. The second one, we have those that are called the uricotelic, uricotelic organisms. Uricotelic organisms excrete theirs. They excrete their nitrogenous waste in form of uric acid. And that is where you have the birds example of organisms e.g. you have the birds we also have the insects in this group which is actually spelling out the answer to our question but let's quickly uh, complete this so the third one there we have those that are called the ammonotelic the ammonotelic organisms these ones excrete their own nitrogenous waste. Excrete theirs in form of ammonia. And this is where we have the Pisces, the fishes. So they excrete their own nitrogenous waste in form of ammonia. And that is why they are called ammonotelic organisms. So we have organisms classified into three based on the type of nitrogenous waste they excrete. They have the ureotelic organisms, the uricotelic organisms, and the ammonotelic organisms. So that is where the answer to that question lies. Option A. And then question 7. Now. Succession that occurs on an abandoned farmland is A. Tertiary, B. Secondary, C. Primary, and D. Climax. When we talk about succession, we are actually talking about uh, ecological succession where there is going to be the colonization of an environment now let me put it here ecological succession is the colonization of an environment by organisms until a climax community is reached or attained. Now we have basically two types of uh, succession types now. We have the first one to be the primary succession. In primary succession, it starts from starts from a barren barren surface or land. And then the second one, which is the secondary. Secondary. This one starts from an already colonized surface. The two types that we have are the ones that we have made mention of. 
we have the primary succession and the secondary succession. So we have the primary succession to be the one that is found on surfaces that have never been colonized before. So it is actually the uh, plants, the green plants that actually uh, happen to be the first colonizers. And then we have the secondary uh, succession to be on surfaces that have already been colonized previously. So for this question here, succession that occurs on an abandoned farmland is a secondary because it has already been colonized before then it is now being colonized by other organisms because it was abandoned so it is colonized by other set of organisms so it is called the secondary succession that is option b option b so we move to question eight in nigeria southern guinea savanna is found in a boronu and sokoto b kogi and kwara c kaduna and cross river and d Kano and Niger. Now we talk about the Guinea savanna. We're actually talking about the middle belt of the country. Now let me quickly show us uh, the parts that we're actually talking about here. Let's assume we draw the map of Nigeria like this. The river Ninja River Benue like this. Now, we have this part here to be the Sahel Savannah. We have this part here to be the Sudan Savannah. We have this part here to be the Guinea Savannah. Here we have the derived Savannah and then the mangrove. That's how we have it. Let me quickly label them here we have what is called the sahel savanna here we have what is called the sudan we have the sudan savanna here we have The Guinea savanna, which is what we are actually looking out for. The Guinea savanna. Here we have the derived savanna. Derived savanna. And lastly, here we have what is called, let me put it here this way. We have it called the humid forest forest zone, or we can call it the mangrove mangrove forest. So that is the division of uh, the part of the country in Nigeria. So it is with this now that we will be able to answer that question. So this is the region that we are actually talking about here. This part here is where we are looking out at. This region here. So that is where the Guinea savanna falls. So the question now is, the southern Guinea savanna is found in, we have Boronu Sokoto, this is up north, so it is not... Uh, in the region that we are talking about, we have Kogi, Kwara, we have Kaduna Cross River, we have Kano and Ninja. Now the answer there is Kogi, Kwara. If we look at the diagram, we notice that it is around this place here. Somewhere around here. Somewhere around this place here. In the middle belt, in the confluence area is where we have uh, Kwara and Kogi. So that is the answer to our question there. The answer to our question there is going to be... Quara and Kogi option B. Option B. So we move to question 9. Which of the following is associated with the dark stage of photosynthesis? A. Assimilation of carbon dioxide. B. Photophosphorylation. C. Photolysis. D. Excitation of chlorophyll. Now, uh, photosynthesis is divided into two stages. We have the light phase and the dark phase. Stages of photosynthesis. 
the stages of photosynthesis we have the first one we said it is the light phase the light phase or stage and that is where we have photolysis where water is being split into its complement ions where we have h2 being divided into its component ions which is going to be hydrogen ion plus the hydroxyl ion that is the light phase it happens during the day in the presence of sunlight and then we have the second reaction which is the dark phase the dark phase now this one happens in the night and it is majorly possible for the absorption of carbon dioxide by the photosynthetic uh, organisms which are definitely the plant so that is the answer to that question so when we look at dark phase it is the dark phase that, that carries out the assimilation of carbon dioxide so that is the answer to question 9 option a and then question 10 the part of ma mammalian skin that excretes metabolic waste is a sweat gland b honey layer c malfigian layer and d sebaceous gland the part of the mammalian skin that actually carries out the excretion of waste is the sweat gland because in the sweat gland we have the elimination of uh, heat from the body in form of water and the water also carries out the dilution of some internal salts that is supposed to be excreted from the body so the heat that is coming out of the body in form of water is being excreted along with some salts like urea and some other uh, materials that are not expected in the body so the answer there is the sweat it is not the honey layer it is not the malfigna layer not the sebaceous gland the sebaceous gland is responsible for the production of sebum which actually nourishes the skin so it is not the sebaceous gland or the malfigna layer not the honey layer so the answer there is the sweat gland which is option a is the answer so we move straight to question 11 now the feeding relationship that exists between a tick and a cow is A. Parasitism B. Mechanism C. Saprophytism and D. Commensalism When we look at ticks, ticks are definitely going to be seen as parasites. A tick on a cow happens to be in a kind of relationship or association where the tick is benefiting from the cow at the expense of the cow. So that will bring me to talk about the types of association that we have. I'll just list them here and I'll explain them. We have the types of association. Types of association. Or relationships. When we look at them, the first one that we're talking about is parasitism. Parasitism is a type of association where we have two organisms. One is called the parasite and the other is called the host. Let me just write it here. A parasite lives in or on the host. Benefiting from it. while the host is losing in the relationship so that is the kind of association that takes place in parasitism so the parasite there is uh, for the question we are talking about the tick is the parasite it is living on the host so in this case here yeah, because we have two types of parasites types of parasites now types of parasites we have the first one to be the endoparasites and then we have the second one to be the ectoparasites so the endoparasites they live inside the body of their host and the ectoparasites they are found on the outside endoparasite example of endoparasite we have the uh the worms that are found in the guts of man that is an example of the endoparasite 
worms in the gut of man that carries out it aids digestion but when it is too much in the system it can actually cause problem for the body and then we have the ectoparasites that are found outside the body of the host they are found on the body on the body of the host so those are examples of ectoparasites an example of ectoparasites we have tick we have lice and so many others so that is what the parasitism is let's move to the next type we have uh, mutualism mutualism in mutualism in mutualism two organisms two organisms participate in the association contributing contributing and benefiting from the relationship so the both of them contribute and they both benefit from the relationship so that is the kind of relationship that we're talking about in mutualism so they both contribute and they both benefit from it so i see mutualism as a plus plus relationship for parasitism let me put it here for parasitism i see it as a plus and a minus let me just we note it here a plus and a minus kind of relationship that is what i see parasitism as a plus and a minus kind of relationship but in the case of mutualism it is a plus plus relationship that is what we have there a plus plus relationship so we are third one is commensalism In commensalism, we have a commensal living and benefit from the relationship. while the host is neither benefiting nor is it losing now in this particular type of association we need to take note of this that the host is neither benefiting nor losing. It is not benefiting and at the same time it is not losing. That is what we have for this type of relationship. So I call this type of relationship a plus and a not relationship. It is not uh, a case of relationship where one is losing or, or the other. Now, in commensalism, the commensal is gaining in that relationship but the host is not gaining and at the same time the host is not losing and that is what we have in this particular type of uh, association example of a commensal relationship we have the relationship between the remoral fish and the sharks remoral fishes they get shelter and accommodation around the environs of the presence of the shark in the other hand the shark is not benefiting anything in that relationship why are the remoral fishes in the environment of the sharks because no other type of fishes will be able to hunt the remoral fish so they get protection and shelter in the environment of the sharks so that is what commensalism talks about in the case of mutualism if i were to give example we will talk about the egret and the cattle egret helps to eat off bugs on the body of the cattle and so it helps to nourish the cattle it removes or it protects the cattle by removing bugs that are feasting on the cattle and on the other hand the cattle is providing uh, transportation as well as food for the egret so we can see that is a win-win situation in the uh, mutual relationship between the egret and the cattle and so the last one that i'll be talking about here is going to be the saprophytism saprophytism 
in saprophytism, the saprophytes feeds on dead or decaying organic matter. That is what saprophytism talks about. So they are feeding on dead, the decaying organic matter. So when we look at the saprophytes, that is where we uh, find examples like the vulture, like the earthworm and some other organisms like that. So basically that is what the types of association that we have, that is at least as far as we can go in order not to waste too much of our time. So the answer to our question now, for that question that we're talking about, which is the relationship between a tick and a cow. It is parasitism because the tick is benefiting on the cow. So our answer there is option A. So we move to question 12. The type of fruit that is formed from a single flower having several free carpels is A. Indehiscent fruit B. Aggregate fruit C. Simple fruit and D. Fleshy fruit When we look at this, we need to understand what some of these terms actually mean. For us to be able to answer this question when we talk about uh, simple fruit we're talking about a kind of fruit that has just one ovary from one flower types of fruits or flowers Simple, simple fruits. It has one ovary from one flower. And then we have the second one to be, we have the flesh. The fleshy fruits. These ones here, they are simple fruits with fleshy pericarps. They are simple fruits. That means they have one ovary. Simple fruits with one ovary having fleshy pericarp. Have a fleshy pericarp. The, the pericarp is actually what we refer to as the fruit wall. And then we have the third one there. The third one there, we have the indehiscent fruits. Indehiscent fruits. Here, we say that indehiscent fruits, they do not split uh, open to release their seeds. At maturation, they are fruits that do not produce or split open. They do not produce their fruits by splitting at maturation. That is, when they mature, they do not split their fruits to produce their seeds. And now, we have the last one there. It is called an aggregate. Aggregate fruit. Aggregate fruit is a type of fruit. A fruit that develops from... A fruit that develops... From the major, from the major of several ovaries, from the major of several ovaries that that were separated in a single flower, in a single flower. 
So that is the answer to our question here. So the answer to our question, question 12, is the aggregate fruit, option B. And then we have question 13. The part that performs urinogenital function in the male reproductive system is the seminal vesicle, the epididymis, the urethra, the ureta. Now, it is the urethra, the tube that runs through the penis or the, uh, the intermittent organ of the male reproductive system is called the urethra. It is called urinogenital, it performs urinogenital function because it actually permits the movement of two substances, the urethra is urinogenital in function because one, it permits the movement or release of urine from the bladder outside to the body outside of the body and then two it also permits the movement or the flow of sperm cells out of the male into the female reproductive parts which is actually the vagina so that is why we say that the urethra is urinogenital because it serves these two functions the first function is the urino function while the second function is the genital Function. So that is the answer to our question there to be option C and then question 14. The components of blood in man are A. Red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma and water. B. Red blood cells, white blood cells and plasma. C. Red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets. D. Red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma and platelets. Now when we look at the components of the blood we have basically two components of the blood. You need to understand this. We have the solid corpuscles and the liquid component. Components of the blood. We have the solid corpuscles. So under the solid corpuscle, we have the first one. We have the first one there to be the RBC, the red blood cell. It is also called the erythrocyte. And then we have the second one called the WBC, which is called the leukocyte. We have the third one there which is the BP, the blood platelet. It is also called the thrombocytes. So those are the solid corpuscles. And then we have the liquid component. We have the liquid component, which actually makes the fourth component of the blood, and that is the blood plasma. We just call it the plasma. So that is a, so we have four components there. We have the first one to be the RBC, the WBC, the RBC is the erythrocyte, the WBC the leukocyte, the BP which is the blood platelet is the thrombocyte and the fourth one is the plasma. So that uh gives the answer to our question which is actually going to be option D. Option D is going to be the answer the red blood cell, the white blood cell, the plasma and the platelet. Option D. And then question 15. The development of big muscles by a wrestler is an example of acquired characteristics, inherited characteristics, mutation, atrophication. Now, such muscles, we said the bulging of the muscle 
of a wrestler. The wrestler never had the muscles. Well, he had the muscle, but the muscles were not mus they were not bulging. So when he started getting the burdening of the muscle was when he started exercising the muscle. So he acquired those characteristics. So this is an example of an acquired characteristic trait. It wasn't inherited because it was not passed on to him or her from the parents. And it is not a genetic mutation. It is not as a result of alteration to the genes, nor is it atrophication. The answer there is the acquired characteristic, which is option a. So we move to question 16. Lack of nucleus is a feature in A. Osteocytes, B. Neurons, C. Erythrocytes, D. Leukocytes. The answer to this particular question is the erythrocytes. Why? Why are we going to be picking erythrocytes? Why is it not osteocytes, neuron, or the leuc uh, leukocytes? All of these other cells have nucleus. But why are we picking erythrocytes? It is basically because the erythrocytes is a flat uh, donut shaped disc. It is round indented in the, at the center, but it has no hollow. Unlike the white blood cell, the red blood cell does not have any nucleus. And that is why it makes it easier for it to uh, move around or to carry transport materials through the body. So that is the answer to question 16 there. Option C. And then question 17. A universal recipient of blood belongs to blood group O, A, B, B, A. Now, these are the four blood types that we have. So, which one of them is the universal recipient? For us to understand this, we need to understand the characteristics of each of these blood types. So, let us quickly look at that. Talking about the characteristics of the blood types, we will have to talk about this. We have just made mention of the blood components, the RBC, the BBC, and the rest of those. So, the characteristics of the blood types, since we have just made mention of the blood types that we have. So, let us look at them. We have blood type A, we have B, we have AB, and we have O. So since these are the blood types that we have, let us look at their characteristics. Each of these blood types have what is called antigen. They all have what is called the antigens, and antigens are found in the RBC. And then, they also have what is called the antibodies. And antibodies are found in the white blood cells. Antibodies in the WBC. Now, these are the major blood uh, components in the blood. So, after now, we will look at the donor and the recipient trait. Here, we will be having the donor. Okay, first and foremost, let's talk about uh, the uh, characteristics. So, talking about the characteristics now, A here has antigen A, and then it has an antibody that is against any other flu, uh, blood type that does not have antigen A. So, the antibody is anti... We have it to be anti-B antibody. That is the antibody that we have in the blood type A. While the B blood type has antigen B, and then its own antibody is going to be anti... anti-A antibody. For the AB blood type, AB blood type has antigen A and antigen B. B. It has antigen A and antigen B, and as, since it has antigen A and B, it does not have any antibody. For the blood type O, blood type O does not have any antigen. As such, it has anti-A and anti-B antibody. It has both antigens for A and B. That is what you will be seeing there. Antigen A and antigen B is what uh, the AB has. But for O, O has just the uh, antibodies. It has anti-A antibody and anti-B antibody. So when we look at the donation uh, train, let us look at how blood is being donated. So I will put that quickly here where we have A, B, 
a b and then o on this other side here we have a we have b we have a b and we have o so looking at this we'll be talking about the blood types and the way they are able to donate their blood So let us see the ones up here. The ones up here, let's see them as the uh, recipients. Recipients. Well, the ones that we have here, let's see them as. We have them as our donors. Now, if we look at it now, the A here has antigen A like we said earlier on so it can easily donate blood to A because the A that is receiving also have what antigen A but it has anti B antibody since it is anti B antibody that it has it will be able to receive blood from A that has antigen A so A can receive blood from A and then A cannot give blood to B because B has anti A antibody B here, A that is giving blood, A which is a donor, has antigen A. But B which is a recipient has anti A antibody. So it cannot receive blood from A. The meaning of the anti there means against. So it is against A. So this will not work. And then we have A giving blood to AB. A can donate blood to AB because A has antigen A and AB also have antigen A. So this one is possible. And then we have A donating to O. A cannot donate to O because O has anti-A antibody. So this is not possible. And then going to B. B cannot donate to A because B has antigen B. And that is what A is against. A has anti-B antibody. So it is against B. So this here is not possible. But B can actually donate to B because it has the anti-gene. A... Uh, a, B can also receive blood from B. B can donate blood to A, B because A, B has the antigen that B has, which is the antigen B. And then for O, B cannot donate to O because B has antigen B and O is against B. We can see the antibody of B here to be anti-B antibody. So this is not possible. And then for A, B. AB cannot donate to A because AB has antigen A quite all right. But we should remember that A, which is a recipient, has anti-B antibody. And that anti-B here is substance that is found in the antigen of AB. So this is not possible. And so since AB cannot donate to A, it also will not be able to donate to B. But it will be possible for AB to donate to AB since they both have the same antigen and they do not have any anti body and then a b cannot donate to o because o has anti a and anti b anti bodies and then looking at the last one here o can actually donate to a because o does not have any antigen since o does not have any antigen there is nothing for any blood type to work against and that is why it is possible for o to donate to a o can also donate to b O can donate to AB and O can also donate to the O blood type. So if we look at it now, we find out that it is in this angle here that we have all of the tracks being marked. That means AB can receive blood from all of the blood groups. And that is why AB, AB is seen as the universal recipient we call the ab the universal recipient and then looking at this angle here this angle here we see that o is able to donate blood to all the tracks o is able to donate blood to all the other blood types and that is why o blood type is called the universal donor so with this knowledge now, we will understand the answer to our question to be AB. Since AB is the only blood type that can receive blood from all the blood groups. So 
AB is the answer to our question, a universal recipient of blood. That is AB option B. And then we move to question 18. The internal structure of a leaf that has larger airspace is A. The palisade mesophyll, B. The epidermis, C. Spongy mesophyll, and D. Vascular bundle. The answer to this question is the option C, which is the spongy uh, mesophyll. Why? The spongy mesophyll uh, functions in a system of allowing for the possibility of interchange of gases, particularly the carbon dioxide that is needed during photosynthesis. So that is why it is uh, responsible for having that internal structure uh, that possess the larger airspace. So the answer is option C, which is uh, the spongy mesophyll. And C. And then question 19. An example of a boreal animal is squirrel, duck, pig, rat. When we talk about arboreal animals, the different types of habitats that we have. Types of habitats. The first one, we have the terrestrial. This is land. The second one, we have aquatic. Aquatic, which is water. And then we have the third one, which is arboreal. Arboreal, which is air. Now, the land there includes mountain tops, mountains, valleys, hills, etc. And then for the water, we have the ponds, oceans, seas, lakes, all the water bodies, etc. And then for the air, we have the treetops, treetops, we have uh, the air. So when we look at them now, organisms that survive on land for the terrestrial. Terrestrial, we have organisms like lion, we have man, we have, uh, let's say, tiger. These are all terrestrial organisms. And then talking about aquatic, we have organisms in the water like the fishes, the Pisces. We have the octopus. We have the whales. These are all animals or uh, organisms that survive in the water. And then for the arboreal, for the arboreal, we have mm -hmm. organisms like the birds. We have the monkeys. Because remember we said treetops. We made mention of treetops as one of the places where we can find the arboreal organism. So we have birds, we have uh, monkeys, we have squirrels. These are organisms that can be found on the treetops. So from, from this now we have the answer to our question there, which is actually going to be the squirrel. Ducks are found in waters, pigs are found on land, rats are found on land, but squirrels can be found on treetops, and that makes it the answer to question 19. Option A. And then we move to question 20. The movement of sugars from the leaf to other parts of the plant is gotation, transpiration, transportation, translocation. Now, when we look at this particular question, the answer is very uh, straight. It is actually translocation. It is not transportation. And this particular process takes place in the phloem. In the parts of the plant, we have two transport supporting tissues. Basically, we call them the vascular bundles. We have the xylem. 
and then the other is the phloem. Xylem transports water. from the roots upwards to plant parts while the phloem carries out what we refer to as transpiration so phloem moves nutrients from the leaves To storage sites so this particular process of the flame moving the nutrient from the leaves to the storage sites or downside of the plant is what we refer to as translocation so that is the answer to that question there translocation so during photosynthesis the leaves produce these nutrients and then they are carried through long series of conducted uh, connected cells Call the flame to various parts of the plant where they are being stored. So that is what that answer is. Option D. So we move to question 21. The gaseous exchange in analysis is more advanced and efficient compared to flatworms because A. The cells of the epidermis have no blood capillaries. B. They have well developed respiratory structures. C. Their cylindrical shape gives high surface area. To volume ratio then d their surface area to volume ratio is very low when we look at this particular question here we'll look at the annelids and then the flatworms example of an annelid is where we have the earthworm an example of a fl uh, flatworm is the tapeworm so which of these ones have uh the, 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 we have we're talking about the gaseous exchange capability and we are saying that it is more advanced in the uh, annelids compared to how we, are, we have it in the flatworm. So why? Why is this possible? It is basically because in the flatworms, the flatworms have uh, every cell in their body located near the external environment. It is only at the tips of their uh, body structure that they have their own uh, gaseous exchange organelles. But when we look at the analytes, the analyst possess a closed circulatory system where food remains uh, entirely connected or contained in the vessel. And that is why we have in the analyst, even if they have simple gills, they do not have lungs. So they, have, they make use of the cells that keep them moist. And they, have, they, they, they make use of direct diffusion to allow gases to spread through them quickly. That is the reason why we have the analysts having more gaseous exchange compared to the flatworms. So the answer to our question there is option C, that the cylindrical shape that the analysts have, the cylindrical shape that the analysts have, make it possible for them to have their uh, circulatory system running through or running across all the body parts. So with this, they have a larger high surface area volume ratio compared to the flat ones and so that is the answer to our question option c is the answer to question 21 and so we move to question 22 the structure that joins the two strands of a chromosome together is the spindle cellulose the centromere and the chromatid uh, granule now when we look at the chromosome in the gene of an organism in the uh, body of an organism in dna of a, of a structure of the dna of an organism we find out that they are joined end to end by a particular substance. That substance that connects them is what we refer to as the uh, centromere. The chromosome regions, known as the centromeres, they play a crucial role in carrying out the assembly of the substances. And then they attach the chromosomes by spindle during cell division so the answer there is the central man which is option c 23 now when a color blind woman marries a normal man what is the probability of your son being color blind a 25 percent b 100 percent c 50 percent and d 
zero percent the question is asking us for the probability of the son of that couple being color blind now looking at this now for the woman the woman has x x chromosome while the man has x y chromosome now let us say that the x chromosome is a trait that actually carries the color blindness now if we look at the color the two chromos the two alleles here that we have here the two alleles the two alleles that we have here they are both coding for the same thing so that means if this one is coding for color blindness this one is also coding for the same color blindness unlike this one here where we have in the male we have two different alleles if the x here is coding for if the x is coding for color blind the y as you can see now is not coding is not what not color blind because the y is not x it is only the x that is blind so if we look at it now either way since the x is the dominant trait here when we carry out cross of the x x and the x y we find out that in every situation we will always have the x uh being what portrayed let us see it we have this one to be the what the x x if you look at the second one again we have this we have it to be the x y and then the next one we have the x and the x again having both the x x and then the last one there we have the x reacting with the y where we also have the what the x y now if you look at all of them now we all have the x showing in all of them this here is the x we have x here we have x here we have x here we also have x here so the possibility of the sun being color blind is in all of these possibilities so there is no instance where the sun will not be color blind it may be total it may be partial but there is going to be the possibility of the sun being color blind and that is since it is four in four it is referred to as hundred percent because out of four we have four options or four possibilities here and of the four possibilities they are all carrying the color blind trait so that is the, the answer there hundred percent so that is option b and then move to question 24 the correct pathway for blood flow from the heart to the tissues of mammals is a heart arterial artery tissues b heart artery arterial tissues c heart vein venal tissues d heart venal vein tissues now it is talking about blood flow from the heart to tissues of the uh, mammals now to answer that question we have the heart And then the heart takes blood through some uh, capillaries called the arteries. Then the arteries also take blood out. Now the arteries divide into multiple vessels, tiny vessels. And these vessels are called the arterioles. The arterioles. And then we have the arterioles going into what we refer to as the capillaries and the capillaries are found in the body of organisms capillaries and then the capillaries will now let me let me because 
those ones are carrying oxygenated blood that is why i'm depicting them in red and then we have these ones here that takes blood back from tissues to organs of the uh to the heart but they pass through some other cell components these cell components are called the venous venous and then the venous they also they are forming networks returning the blood back to the heart so they pass through what we refer to as the veins and then the vein is now responsible for taking the blood back to the heart so that is how the circulation occurs so the right flow of blood from the heart to organs of the body we have it to come from this here we have number one starting from here so we have the arteries we have the arteries to the arterioles and then to the capillaries or the tissues of the body so that is where we have the uh, substance there you can see it starting from the heart to the arteries so this is number one number two number three and then tissues here number four so heart arteries arterioles then capillaries that's the answer to our question heart artery arterioles and then tissues option b and then question 25 all trees with buttress roots and evergreen leaves are characteristic features of when a tree has buttress roots it means the root system is very very extensive very very broad and then evergreen leaves this is a major characteristic of an environment that is uh, rich in water that has abundant uh, rainfall so it is definitely not the temperate grassland because temperate grassland is, like the name implies it is uh dominantly uh filled with grasses so it is not that also it is not the southern guinea uh savanna it is not the northern guinea savanna because those environments also have grasses there they are predominantly covered with grasses so it is the rainforest the tropical rainforest that have such trees here that have evergreen leaves and buttress roots so that is the answer to question 25 option c option c so we'll move to question 26 the genes crossing over occurs during fertilization, mutation, mitosis, and meiosis. Looking at this question here, we will understand that the answer is option D. The answer we have there is option D. It is during meiosis that we have the generation of new uh, combination of genes. So genes can cross over like we talked about some minutes ago. We have this. So if you look at this trait here, we have recombination of gene here. So it is this place here that we refer to as meiosis. Here is where we have meiosis taking place, where there is going to be recombination of gene. We can see this one, two, one, two. So here we have a combination of one and one. That is one from here. Or let me put it A1, A2. And then this one is B1, B2. So we have A1 and B1 combining here. Here we have A1 and B2. Here we have A2 and B1. And here we have A2 and B2. So we can see that recombination of gene is taking place here. And that is what gives rise to all of these traits that we have in this world in this place here, a lot of these four possibilities here they are brought about by the possibility of meiosis taking place that brings about the combination of genes so that is the answer to our question which is meiosis option d and then 27 now in genetic counseling a man with hemoglobin hemoglobin formation hba hbs is most preferred to marry a woman of a a, H B A A B H B C H C H B M F and D H B S S. Now, when we look at this, we're talking about the genotypes. So, talking about the genotypes, let us quickly make mention of the commonest of the genotypes. Now, we have A A, we have A C, 
we have AS, we have SC, we have SS. Now, of all of this here, this one here, all of these ones here, they are all uh, carriers of the sickle cell. But this one here, okay, this one here is supposed to be SS. Please permit me to quickly correct that. SS. Now they are all carriers. So in the question that we have there, the question is asking us that somebody who has AS, somebody who is AS, can marry what kind of uh, spouse? Now, if the person is AS, the only possibility that will not give any genomic problem or genetic situation is when the person marries AA. If the person marries AA, then all of the offsprings will be having AA or AS. That is the possibility. Because when A crosses with A, when A crosses with A, what you will be having is going to be the possibility of AA. And then when A crosses with S, the only possibility we'll be having is going to be AS. So this is still preferably very what? Okay. We still have this one to be preferably okay. But in a scenario where the AS if AS marries any other one, let's start with AS marrying AS. If AS marries AS, there's a possibility of them having what we refer to as the AA. Yes, they can. They can have AA. And also, there's also the possibility of them having AS. And sometimes that may be very, very uh, okay. But we also have another possibility there which is not okay at all. And that is when the S happens to uh, cross with the S again, where they now have a yield of this. This here is giving rise to S. It's giving rise to SS. And now this is very, very dangerous. So... AS is not advised to marry AS so because of the possibility of the SS. And so if we look at other traits too, we could be having AC, AS, SC. And so all of those things will read or yield uh, a, a very, very terrible outcome. So the only possibility, the only positive possibility is when AA marries AS. So that is the answer to our question there for Question 27. The answer is option A. And so we move to question 28. An ecological instrument used to measure wind direction is A. Session disc B. Wind vein C. Anemometer. And then is D. Slope gauge. When we look at all of these instruments, they are all economic, uh, ecological instruments. Session disc is used to measure turbidity in water. Wind vein is used to measure wind direction. Uh, an anemometer is used to measure the speed of wind, the speed at which the wind is blowing. And then D, which is slope gauge, is used to measure the slope of a plane. We also have some other ecological instruments like the thermometer. Thermometer is used to measure temperature. We have the barometer that is used to measure pressure and a whole lot of others. So this particular question is asking us for the one that is used in measuring wind direction. So it is actually option B. That is the answer to that question, wind vein. Question B. So we move to question 29. The growth of muko on a piece of bread is A, scavenging, B, commensalism, C, autotrophism, and D, saprophytism. If you remember, some minutes ago, we talked about uh, mode of nutrition, where we made mention of this. We talked about the types of association where we talked about parasitism, uh, commensalism, mutualism, we can see the others here. Now, the last one that we have here, this one here, saprophytism. I said saprophytism is a scenario where we have the saprophytes feeding on dead or decaying organic matter. So that is actually the answer to the question we have been asked. Option D. And then we have question 30. Conversion of atmosphere carbon 
into chemical bond energy occurs during the process of transpiration, photosynthesis, digestion, and then respiration. If you look at this now, conversion of atmospheric carbon into chemical bond occurs during photosynthesis. How? Atmospheric carbon is introduced into the carbon through so many processes. Example is respiration in animals. Animals breathe in oxygen and then they carry out the release of carbon dioxide. Also during burning, for example, there is also the release of carbon to the atmosphere. Now all of this carbon is used by the plants to actually manufacture their food in the presence of sunlight to produce what we refer to as the their own food, the process of autotroph uh, uh, the autotrophic nutrition. That is where the carbon in the atmosphere is used to uh, generate carbon bonds. So that is actually the answer there, photosynthesis. So it is the plant that makes use of the atmospheric carbon to carry out chemical bond energy. So that is the answer, option B. So question 31 now. The display of male agama lizard is to A. Scare predators B. Regulate body temperature C. Attract female for mate and then D. Give invites to intruders The display of the male agama lizard We know it is always the, agama, the male agama lizard that, that carries out the display Now the display that they carry out is specifically to attract mates It is not to scare predators because they can actually hunt So they do not do that to... they do not display to actually scare predators and then they also do not display for regulation of body temperature if they want to regulate their body temperature they just bask in the sun and then they do not give invites to intruders the actual reason why they carry out display is to attract female males they are showing their readiness to the female uh lizards that they are ready to actually carry out what we refer to as copulation so that is the answer to question 31 option c and then question 32 the end product of the digestion of carbohydrates is A. Amino acid B. Glycerol C. Glucose D. Sucrose When carbohydrate is being digested, it is being digested to glucose. It is the proteins that are being digested to amino acid. Glycerol is the end product of the fatty acids or the end product of fats and oils. When fat and oils are being broken down, it is being broken down into fatty acid and glycerol. And then sucrose is a type of carbohydrate, but it is not the end product of carbohydrate because sucrose can still be broken down into uh, glucose. We can have sucrose being broken down into fructose and, and glucose. So that is not the end product of digestion in carbohydrate. The end product is actually glucose. It is when the product... Uh, when the food has been broken down, when carbohydrate has been broken down into glucose, that is when it becomes usable for the body cells. So the answer there is option C to question 32. And question 33, the sum total of all observable features of an organism. Please, this question here, we need to see this. All observable features. Features that we can see observable features features that we can see we do not necessarily have to carry out any blood test or any type of test to actually see these features so the sum of all these features is actually the phenotype it is not the genotype because genotype is the sum of all uh body characteristics that are found in the gene of the organism the sum of the gene characteristics that can only be seen when the test, the blood test or blood work is done. That is what the genotype is. But when we talk about the uh, the phenotype, it is talking about observable features. Genotype is just talking about the genetic makeup of the organism and can only be gotten when there is a blood work. But the phenotype is the physical expression of the organism, what you can see on the outside of the body of the organism. That is what we refer to as the phenotype. So that is the answer to question 33A. Is the answer and then we move to question 34 pentadactyl plan of the four limbs of frog bird horse whale and man is a proof of a spontaneous generation b evolution c locomotion and d creation now when we look at the pentadactyl plan of the four limbs the pentadactyl there is telling us that we have a penta plan 
the penta there talks about five so if you look at the digits of all of these organisms the frogs the birds the horses the wheels the man they all have uh, five digits on their limbs the frogs as well as the horse the nose uh, the birds and the organisms that are listed here if you look at the frogs you find out that on their limbs they have four digits the birds also on their wings they have and their toes they have four digits the horses the wheel and man as well and the man we have four digits the fingers in our in our hands and then the toes on the feet they are five in number so all of this attests to the fact that we all have what is referred to as ancestral generation that we all came from the same or similar organism and that is talking about evolution it is the evolution of organism that actually talks about the different changes that have taken place in organisms over a very long period of time so looking at the pentadictyl plan now it is talking about the ability of these organisms emanating from a similar uh, ancestor so that is basically what evolution is talking about it is not spontaneous generation it is not locomotion and neither is it creation it is evolution that is option b and then question 35 the under secretion of thyroxine in children results in a goita b gingitism c kwashoko and d creatinism thyroxine is a particular hormone that is produced in the neck of uh humans or in the neck of animals it is produced in a particular gland in the neck of the animals called called the thyroid gland now inflammation of the thyroid gland is what refers to goita and this happens basically or oftentimes in the adults but when this thyroxine is under secreted in children what it results to is what we refer to as creatinism Kwashoko is a condition that is caused as a result of inability or lack of proteins in the diet of an individual or of an organism. When there is lack of protein, when the organism is basically feeding on carbohydrates only and it is not supplemented with proteins, that is when this condition Kwashoko can actually occur. And then gigantism is as a result of over secretion of thyroxine. Over secretion of thyroxine is what results to gigantism but when this thyroxine in the thyroid gland is under secreted in children it results to creatinism so that is option d and then question 36 the petaloid sepals serve the function of a carrying out photosynthesis b attracting pollinating agents to a flower c retaining pollen grains in corolla tubes and then d protecting the inner floral parts of the flower that particular question there has its answer in the d when we look at d that is where we have the answer to that particular question protecting the inner floral parts of the flower why because it is typical that they protect the flower bud they protect the flower in bud and provide support for the male for the petals when they are in bloom so that is basically the function of the uh the petaloid sepals the sepals protect the internal floral parts of the uh flower they protect the bud they protect them from damage and that is the answer to that question it is not that they carry out photosynthesis they do not attract pollination because they do, they are not producing the pollens and they do not retain pollen grains in the corolla their function there is to protect the inner floral part of the flowers that is option d and then 37 the system of classification in which there are seven hierarchies from kingdom to species was introduced by when we talk about the hierarchies of the organisms we read them just now to be seven so this is these are the kingdoms we have the kingdom or these are the classifications rather the phylum or division we have the class order family we have the genus and we have the species so if we count 
we have one two three four five six seven so these are the classification or the hierarchical uh, classification we call them the taxonomy the classification so the hierarchical classification of organism kingdom phylum or division the class other family genus species so who postulated this classification who brought about this classification it is not felix that jordan it is not Theodore Schwann, it is not Charles Darwin. The person that actually did that is called, it is Carolus Linus that actually did this uh, classification of the hierarchy. So that is option B. So we have question 38. An adaptive feature of camel to the desert is A. Ability to increase sweat production. B. Ability to pass high amount of urine. C. Ability to tolerate low degree of dehydration. D. Ability to tolerate high degree of dehydration. Now, when we look at camels, camels are organisms that are found oftentimes in the desert. And this is because they have the ability to tolerate high degree of dehydration. If you look at the environment that camels are found, they are found in the desert. And the characteristics of the desert is that it has low rainfall and high temperature. Since there is low rainfall, there is going to be low humidity. And then high uh, temperature. If the temperature is very high, it means the organism will rapidly carry out what we refer to as water loss to the surrounding. But in the case of the camels, they are able to survive in that environment because they can actually tolerate high degree of what? Dehydration. They can actually dehydrate, but they have the ability to tolerate it because they can actually take in large amount of water when they come across water. So they gradually lose this water to the surrounding and then they can still tolerate high degree of dehydration. So that is the answer to question 38, option D. And then we move to question 39. Yes, the part labeled 2. The part labeled 2 in this structure here, we can see the part labeled 2 on the outside here. We can see it. So the part labeled 2 is A, pellicle, B, the cytoplasmic connections. C, the flagella, and D, the cells. The answer there is the cytoplasmic collection. That is the answer to question 39. The cytoplasmic collection. It is not the pellicle, it is not the flagella, uh, nor is it the cell. It is the cytoplasmic connection. That is option B. And then question 40. The organism above, this organism that we just finished talking about, this particular organism, what organism is this? Is it Clamadomonas? Is it algae? Is it Volvox? Is it Euglena? This organism here, as you can see in the diagram above, is actually the Volvox. This organism here, this is a Volvox. It is not Clamadomonas. It is not algae. It is not Euglena. It is the Volvox. So that is option C. So question 41 now. The big structure of the organism is best adapted for now, looking at this organism here, this bed here, we can see the big structure. The big structure is long and pointed and sharp. It is not for pecking grass or for picking grass rather. It is not for picking grass. It is not for killing. If it were for picking grass, it would be flat like that of uh, a bird, uh, of a domestic fowl. It is not for killing and picking fish. Hence, it would have been strong and short. It is not for pecking wood as well. This particular beak is for sucking nectar because it inserts, you can see that the beak looks like a proboscis, so it inserts it into the, the parts of the body of the plant and then it uses it to suck nectar. So that is the answer to that particular question. It makes use of this particular structure to suck nectar. That is what it uses it for. So that is option D. And then 42. One of the functions of water in seed germination is to A. Dilute the embryo B. Make the soil wet and soft C. Activate the enzymes and D. Promote aerobic respiration The function of water in seed germination is to actually activate the enzyme The enzymes that carry out or bring about uh, seed germination particularly gibberellin which breaks uh, seed dormancy 
is actually the function of the water there it brings about the action of this enzyme into action so it activates the enzyme so that is the answer to question 42 option c and then 43 which of the following is an example of an adaptation for survival in social insects social insects are insects like the bees and the ants the termites now the reason why they are called social insects all is because of the level of cooperation or the level of the diversity that they have in them they actually carry out what we refer to as division of labor because they are divided into castes and sects and so uh, this adaptation for survival is migration to warmer climates production of venom for defense formation of complex caste system hibernation during winter months it is because of their caste system they have formation of caste system complex caste system in the bees we have the workers we have the uh the reproductives as well as the uh the soldiers so also we have in the termites so all of this classification or this complex caste is the reason why they are able to survive and they are able to adapt uh holistically in the environment that they find themselves so that is the answer to question 43 option c so question 44 the natural place of an organism or community is known as a niche habit biome habitat a niche is a specific environment for a specific organism a niche is a specific environment for a specific organism habit is not part of it a biome is talking about the characteristic appearance of an environment so the answer to this question they're talking about the natural place of an organism is talking about the habitat the habitat is the natural dwelling place of an organism so that is the answer to question 44 option d and then question 45 which of the following is not a part of the alimentary canal a esophagus b the large intestine c liver d the small intestine the, the part that is not part of the alimentary canal this the option that is not part of the alimentary canal is actually the liver the liver is not part of the alimentary canal because the alimentary canal is called the digestive system the liver is not part of that system so it is the liver that is the answer to this particular substance it is in the esophagus that the food passes through from the mouth into the stomach the small intestine is where we have the digestive enzymes acting on the food and then after the phase of digestion the waste materials are being passed into the large intestine or the colon but the liver does not have any role to play in all of this so that is the answer to question 45 option c and then question 46 which of the following function is performed by the skin to help maintain homeostasis in the human body homeostasis is talking about regulation of internal environment that is what homeostasis is talking about so the skin is one of the organs that actually bring about these regulations so how does the skin do that a regulation of body temperature b filtration of blood c production of hormones and d digestion of food the skin does not bring about the digestion of food and the skin is not responsible for the production of hormones either the skin is also not responsible for the filtration of blood the function of the filtration of blood is brought about by the kidney it is in the digestive system or the alimentary canal that like we made mention of in the past question that makes or carries out the digestion of food and the production of hormones we have several hormonal glands in our body we call them the endocrine glands they are responsible for the production of hormones example of such glands we have the uh, pituitary gland that produces the pituitary hormone we have the thyroxine producing the thyroid gland we have pan uh, pancreatic gland that produces insulin and glucagon we have the gonad glands in the males that produce the testosterone in the females it produces estrogen and progesterone the actual function of the skin here in humans is the regulation of body temperature that is how it brings about regulation of internal environment called homeostasis so that is our answer to question 46 option a and then question 47 which component of blood is responsible for carrying oxygen to the body tissues we have talked about the components of the blood earlier on we said here we have the components of the blood the rbc the wbc the bp and then the blood plate uh, the blood plasma now the rbc is responsible for carrying blood across the body and then it is responsible for transporting oxygen specifically 
because it possesses a particular substance called the hemoglobin. When the red blood cell hemoglobin binds to oxygen, it forms what we refer to as the oxyhemoglobin. So that is the answer to that particular question. The component that carries blood in the body of the organism is actually the red blood cell because it has the ability to bind to oxygen because of the presence of hemoglobin that the red blood cell has. So that is option C. And then question 48. Which of the following blood vessels carries oxygenated blood away from the heart? Which of the following blood vessels carries oxygenated blood away from the heart? The blood vessel that carries oxygenated blood away from the heart is the arteries. Look at this here. So this one's here, this vessel, this transportation that is in red, we can see the arrows showing red, they are oxygenated blood. So it is the arteries that carries the blood away from the heart. So that is where we have the answer there. These ones that are shown in green arrows, we have them carrying deoxygenated blood. The oxygen has been removed from this one and so that they are carried by the veins or the venous, which are the smaller, uh, the smaller tubes of the veins. So, but the one that carries oxygenated blood, they are the arteries and then the arterioles. So that is the answer to that particular question, question 48, option A. And then question 49, which of the following is an example of a behavioral adaptation for survival in animals? A. Sharp teeth, migration, wings, camouflage. Sharp teeth is an adaptation, structural adaptation for feeding. Wings is a structural adaptation for movement. Camouflage is a structural adaptation for concealage. So the only one that is behavioral here is migration. It is during migration that we have the behavior of such organisms being portrayed. When organisms find themselves in an environment that is not favorable, they want to survive that environment. And so uh, the only uh, behavioral adaptation that comes to mind is for them to actually move out of that environment that is not favorable. So they carry out migration. That is option B. And then question 50 there. Which of the following is a male reproductive organ in humans? Uterus, ovary, testis, fallopian tube. It is not the uterus. The uterus is also called the womb. It is where the embryo, developing embryo develops. The ovary is the part of the female reproductive system that actually produces the ova or the egg cells. And then the fallopian tube is where the mature egg cells lie in wait for the sperm cell for carrying out fertilization. So all of these three, the uterus, the ovary, the fallopian tube, they are found in the females. The only one that is found in the male is the testes, which is responsible for the production of sperm cells. So that is option C for question 50. So with this now, we have come to the end of the questions in the JAM 2022 biology series. I will implore you to try as much as possible to go through all that has been discussed, go through the questions and the answers that have been given to all of them, and try as much as possible to practice questions. I will implore you to go through our channel. There are more questions from Jam Biology series. So try as much as possible to watch them and get the answers and the explanations that I'll be giving to them. I will plead with you to try as much as possible to subscribe to our channel if you have not done so. If you have not subscribed to our channel previously, subscribe to the channel because you have a lot to gain from it. And also, if you have subscribed, don't forget to like our content, share them as well with your friends, let them also benefit from what you are getting. And then, please, we want to hear from you, so drop your questions in the comment section. I wish you success in your exams and best of luck. Bye for now.